Uh, good afternoon, everyone. We have the pleasure to welcome today Professor Abbas Firozabadi. Professor Firozabadi is a senior scientist and member of the Department of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering at Rice University, Houston. He's also the director of the Reservoir Engineering Research Institute. Professor Firozabadi has taught graduate thermodynamics at Stanford University, Imperial College London, Yale University, Tokyo University, and Peck University. The major research focus on Professor Feroz Abadi has been on efficient production for subsurface, conventional and unconventional hydrocarbons formation and related environment stewardship. His current focus includes molecular engineering to use small amounts of functional molecules for efficiency in hydrocarbons energy production. Professor Feroz Abadi is the author of two books on thermodynamics and he has published some 250 journal papers. He's also received four of the major awards of the Society for Petro uh, Petroleum Engineering, including the Anthony Lucas Good Medal. So welcome, Professor Prasabadi. Thank you so much. And please feel free to start your presentation. Thank you very much for the nice introduction. So I'm going to share the screen. Okay, uh, good afternoon for the colleagues in uh, uh, Brazil. It's a pleasure to share some thoughts with the colleagues in Brazil. I have been interacting with uh, uh, Petrobras for over 25 years. I have taught uh, uh, some graduate intensive courses at uh, Campinas State University and I've uh, had interacted with uh, Professor uh, Fred Tavares uh, for a few years on, on Petrobras projects. Uh, Abbas, sorry for interrupting you, but uh, can you move your camera again? Because it, it... Okay, now I can see myself. Okay, that's good. That's good. Now there's no problem. Nice, okay. thanks. Basically, you know, the type of work we do we mentor some students and uh, uh, postdocs. In my, I have been lucky that I have learned a lot uh, for the people I have interacted with. And actually the first one I have here is Alan Ali Dios. He is from uh, uh, Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. Uh, she worked with me on irreversible thermodynamic issues, mostly related to diffusion. She's working at uh, Exxon Mobil now. I introduced a couple of the people I've worked with. Um, Zui Jin is uh, teaching at the University of Alberta. He did actually a lot of work in molecular simulation when I was getting into the area. Uh, I have uh, a current postdoc from Peking University. Tian Hao Wu is doing a lot of work on surface energy. I would not talk about it, just one slide, but uh, that's an area that I'm intensively working uh, now. And here maybe another colleague on uh, CO2 viscosification. He was the one who did the work. Armando did the work on DPD simulations and embarked actually, or help us to get into the area. You know, these people are variety of different backgrounds. Armando has a PhD in physics uh, from Stanford University and he's teaching in Mexico. Uh, there are all the colleagues I've learned a lot from them, all of them pleasant experiences. It seems that we have uh, vast opportunities uh, to do things basically. The areas, a lot of new areas have uh, popped up or have been there so we can use uh, our uh, knowledge. Mostly actually I would say, I, I am surprised because I'm new to the field, you know, I started work on molecular simulations uh, five, six years ago. But um, I've been surprised how helpful it is to engineer new molecules. And the example I, I will basically state is that we have been recently able to engineer two new molecules uh, for CO2 viscosification. And one molecule by accident, basically we have found out it's 100 times more effective than other molecules in terms of the amount. So basically we wanted to 
use molecular engineering to study the processes that are complicated without them. And uh, also lately I've got into the second, the second item, both of them is one, uh, is on fluid and solid basically, surface energies and related. I just mentioned very briefly here, that's the area I'm working on and you know, we'll have few publications soon. One thing from hydrocarbons, because we are, we are talking about hydrocarbons, hydrocarbons are giving us problem in relation to global warming. It's very clear cut that in the past, whenever the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has been high, the temperature has been high. This four cycles the past 400,000 years. And the amount of CO2 basically in the atmosphere in the, in the past for most of the duration has been below 280. Now, if you look at it, what is happening is that it's going up basically. And the consequences could be enormous. Uh, actually, I, as, as a part of a course I teach in thermodynamics, I teach a calculation of a past climate changes based on irreversible thermodynamics. And you, know, the, you take the sample, basically what they have taken, there are samples uh, from, um, uh, from ice in the subsurface. You can get what is the concentration of CO2 and then you have to go up in the atmosphere to see what it is. And both the age and the concentration we can, we can actually determine. So these are not subject to question. And the consequences basically we are seeing that, you know, one aspect is basically, mm, this is a possible effect uh, from uh, global warming. So it's, it is a clear, basically, um, clear that CO2 should not go, should be not be dumped into atmosphere. Uh, so let's see what we can do in that direction or basically become more efficient. Don't use too many chemicals, use chemicals which are more friendly to the atmosphere. Uh, so the first item I'll talk about, and they have a lot of material, so I'm sharing ideas rather than going to on one subject uh, deep, but you know, there is a purpose I have. About two or three years ago, we, by accident, we find out in the lab that if you use one type of molecule, will improve oil recovery and uh, at 100 times less concentration than other chemicals. And this uh, molecule, this functional molecule uh, is affected through changes the interface elasticity, which we are neglecting all, all of our calculation, basically. We focus on interfacial tension, for example which is really different property. Interfacial tension is a function of the amount of the surfactant at the interface. Elastic is related to the structure, molecular structure at the interface. So let's see basically uh, what, you know, we just run into uh, from good luck and how we can use 100 ppm chemicals that is even in very large scale, we don't need more than 100 ppm. Somehow this molecule, 70, 80 ppm is effective, if it's going, if it's going to be effective. Uh, so we have to measure the interface elasticity. I will not go through it. And that's actually in a paper we published in 2016, we see the relationship. And there is another author, Alvaro from the University of Wyoming in, in, in respect to another process is called low sanity water. Uh, introduced the idea, or it tries, the idea has been there in the literature related to oil recovery. Uh, so basically we wanted to see if we can change the interface elasticity, interface between water and oil, and what concentration is required, what is the, what, what is the outcome. Now, uh, there are a lot of oils that if you put them in contact with water, they form water oil emulsions. So this is basic, and many, many oils, many production facilities, you have water in oil. You could have it 20, 30, 40% water in oil in the form of emulsion, some type of emulsion. So there is a molecule, it's a surfactant basically. Um, it's called demulsifier, which you add 100 ppm, you see that it destabilizes emulsions. 
And uh, so uh, we were doing some experiments and we found out that when this molecule is injected water, we get higher recovery. So we did not have any plan in that direction. So if you look at the here, the interface elasticity of water and oil, this is without adding the chemical. If you add the chemical, it reduces significantly. Higher phase angle, phase angle is a measure of elasticity of the interface. So if you add 100 pp of this molecule to the interface, it reduces the phase angle. Phase angle of zero means very elastic. Phase angle of zero means non-elastic. <coughs> so the lower value is better, makes it more elastic. So we see that actually in this particular system, this is the effect. And then we see that if we do oil recovery, if we have it, the seawater injection, this is the recovery. If you low sanity water in this case, you get a little bit extra recovery, but if I add 100 ppm of these molecules, I get uh, increase in, in recovery. And this is another type of rock. And somehow, surprisingly, <coughs> the type of rock doesn't affect the, the chemical. So that means actually what is important is not related to fluid solid interface. In this particular case, is only fluid fluid interface and it's not interfacial tension, it's not variability, which is really the common way of thinking. And that's, you know, there is maybe 50, 60 papers are published a year. All of them almost exclusively uh, are based on in interfacial tension variability, but seems that um, the elastic of the interface is important. This is another sample, another oil. Uh, and then we are looking at the interface elasticity. This is high sanity water. This is low sanity water. This is DI water. And this is what we call conate water. The water has a very high salt content. And we see that in these cases, basically, this chemical is um, effective uh, somewhat. And, uh, and this is the result on oil recovery. So if we have seawater, injecting seawater, this is the oil recovery. If you add 100 ppm of chemical, there is a 20% increase in recovery. And there's a lot of other benefits and there's other kinds of variation I have, but the whole thing is that we see basically recovery related to change of interfacial elasticity and if we can increase it, we get higher recovery. Now, uh, let's see what the process is. And what do we mean by interface elasticity in terms of some molecular structure? So we devise a setup. Um, I have a postdoc, he devised a setup. He put oil here. Sorry, this is water first. This is oil on top of it and is a camera you can see. And in order to see it, we have changed the oil because we don't have the facilities. I'm thinking of the facilities we can use crude oil, but we have diluted oil with toluene, just for the purpose of demonstration. So this is really the key item that I wanted to share with, with you. I'm just writing a paper to publish it. If you add this molecule to, uh, to oil, if you don't add it, I have emulsions, basically. When I add it, I get emulsions, basically. I add the emulsion at 100 ppm, the demultifies basically the uh, emulsions. However, look at what happens at the surface. So this is in the bulk oil phase. This is at the interface. So at the interface, I form emulsions. And this is known in other areas. Actually, this is called uh, um, a spontaneous emulsification at the interface. But this is for this system we are seeing. So basically we change the structure at the interface. Uh, so this is, we call it a new process actually. Interfacial elasticity by ultra lo low concentration of functional molecules may be more efficient than the conventional processes. Uh, because this is all out of accident, we have only worked with one demulsifier. So we are thinking if we can find something to be more effective. And the luck has been with us in, in this research, like a lot of research, we, we are sometimes lucky. 
Uh, I'll go to the next topic, which is uh, CO2 viscosification. This is an area has been in literature for a long time. There are many attempts by many different groups to increase viscosity of CO2 by functional molecules. Um, what I started, I started to look at the literature to see who has done the work and then try to understand the molecular structure with respect to um, what uh, these functional molecules do to viscosify CO2. Uh, just to show one motivation is that this is only one field application that uh, CO2 is used for fracking the rock. They have used water, water is not effective. They create fractures, but they don't get benefit from that actually. And there are many reasons why uh, they don't get benefit. So CO2 when used is enormous change in the well production. This is a paper published uh, last year in a journal called Dual. Apparently it's a, it's a journal of high impact factor, about 20. Uh, so, but the problem with what they did is that this molecule they have used is extremely expensive. Uh, and that's the only example uh, which was done in China. China has the number one shared resources in the world. Uh, the problem with carbon dioxide is, is really gas-like uh, viscosity and fluid-like density. And it's very difficult to dissolve heavier hydrocarbons in it. Uh, and, and we have challenges to overcome because even what is done in the literature, we cannot use those molecules for the application we are looking at. Just to show what another application for improved recovery is that the slide in the top uh, is the paper actually we published with uh, Petrobras colleagues uh, sponsored by Petrobras. Rogerio, Dr. Rogerio Esposito was the, the co-author of the work and uh, we saw very good recovery. But the problem is that we had earlier breakthrough. So this is CO2 inject. CO2 is heavier than the oil, so it goes down and the oil out. So you get very good recovery, but you get what we call early breakthrough. Now, if you can, I can viscosify CO2 10 times, it's really like piston, which is the oil. So this is a motivation. Uh, and uh, so if you can succeed a molecule that viscosifies the, um, the CO2, we get enormous benefit. This is another slide I have if I inject water. This is just simulation, but the concept, again, we are writing a paper. If you inject only water, you get 40% recovery. If you inject CO2, again, you have early breakthrough, but you have to inject a lot. If you inject VAG, like Pet Petrobras is doing, you know, combine water and CO2, you get better, better performance. But if I can viscosify, say, 10 times, what I get, I get very high recovery, basically. So uh, if I can do it, and then we are in that direction. We should use a small amount. Now, another application is that basically, if you go into the lab and try to pressurize a fluid and um, destabilize the rock, make the rock fail, that means uh, frack it. You see that CO2 is very different than water. Uh, water is in incompressible, so basically, quickly the pressure goes up, but you have to go to something like 30 megapascal to create the frack. If you CO2 actually, you get the, the value a half. The issue is that, and there are other different, why there is a difference between fluid and cracking the rock? That's really the question. And now we have pinpoint that really we have to look for surface energy. And that's, we are finding a way to get the surface energy. Well, again, on this changing the viscosity, there are two types of molecules in the literature, one, molecules that they are put fluorinated, they put fluorine in it, uh, that you can solubilize and also is effective. Or you have two types of molecules that have been used. I'm just going to go quickly. One of them is polyvandesine, which uh, with six monomers of it, that has been the only thing tested. It shows some promising result and another type of molecule. I will show you the basically uh, the molecular structures of this. So if you use fluorine-based 
um, polymers, we get at say four five percent concentration, we get two hundred times increase in viscosity. But you look at the price; is unaffordable. Two hundred thousand dollars per kilogram. You can reduce it by this, end. and also five percent is very high. So it's not practical basically, to use it. Even this molecule, when we wrote the paper one year ago, we said that it will not work. And we'll show you actually why it will not work. Even, even you viscosify it, it will not work in practice. It absorbs on the rock, so it's not good. This molecule is basically has uh, branches. And it seems that uh, it does very moderate increase, you know, two or three times increase at four or five. We have taken actually this molecule and have changed it. And now we can get whatever value we want from the viscosity at very low. And our limit is 1%. Whatever we do, we should get viscosity increase at 1%. This is another type of molecule. So the reason, these are all the material in the literature. We have tried to uh, see how they work and uh, how we can learn from them. Again, for molecular simulation, especially related to rheology viscosity, we cannot really work with uh, uh, empty simulation. We have to do uh, two mesoscopic simulations. And here you are, you are using DPD. Uh, the Armando who worked with me is an expert on DPD basically. So we can increase computer speed by three orders of magnitude, basically, and we can go to larger systems, which we need here in this purpose for the purpose of viscosity and designing the setup the way it, uh, it needs to be. And these are the, the three molecules in uh, DPD configuration. So this is the molecule actually we have taken, we have changed it now. And this molecule, we have found it one percent. We can achieve other objectives, and that's that has been basically molecular simulation to engineer the molecule, then synthesize it, and then test it basically, and then the other molecules. And from here, what we learned: what is the process basically? Why these molecules viscosify CO two? In the case of P one D. we see that they don't really aggregate. It's just all these uh, branches that uh, uh, basically um, lead to viscosity increase. This is I, on the left, I have it on in a you know, basically in equilibrium condition. In the right, I have it in flow, basically configuration. The same, the molecule don't stick together actually. This is another type of molecule which form links, basically forms a chain. And uh, the molecule basically um, get together, but not uh, aggregate in the sense of uh, uh, form a chain like a structure. And this is uh, basically what they do. This is different from the other one. And a small amount of water has a big effect, just like in the case of uh, 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 my cells. We need to have a little bit of water. And here, the same thing changes. And it promotes actually a small amount, very small amount of water have uh, some, uh, enhances the process. And this is some uh, uh, details here. Now, in the case of uh, the fluorinated molecule, which basically is the emphasis in the literature, because they have aromatic rings, we do get pi pi stacking and there is some, some association. So it's not just like P1D. And that's depending what is the ratio of uh, aromatic rings to the rest of the structure, we, get, we may get a more effectiveness, but it should not be too much that we get intra uh, stacking. It should be inter stacking. And now these are basically results from measurements and molecular simulation for P1D. So it seems that we get reasonable results. And we have done all kinds of verification from DPD because I was new, I was careful to see to get, I can get IFT and other properties that they are available. And this is with the, uh, basically with the fluorinated molecules, very expensive molecules. 
And uh, this is comparison between molecular simulation, DPD simulations, and uh, so we learned a lot actually from this. And I was mentioning that this molecule will not work. The reason it adsorbs. See if this molecule you put in CO2, the uh, the pressure drop should be in CO2. Pure CO2 should be 0.1 psi pressure drop. If you put it there, should be four times, five times at the concentration they have used. But you get enormous pressure drop, fully adsorbed basically. So that means actually this structure will not have applications that we are looking at for some of the applications. So and now I would not talk about what we have done recently. Uh, we are patenting uh, and also, you know, publication there is delay because of sponsors. But all, all I could say is that from analysis of the, what has been the literature, trying to understand mechanism, we can now have 1% molecule to achieve our objectives. Plus molecular simulations help us to see if you have absorption in different types of rock and we don't have adsorption. In other words, we have to be careful not to have functionality in the molecules to have adsorption. So that's where uh, the status is. Uh, I'm going to switch another different subject in related to um, molecular simulation and we have, what we have learned. This relates to hydrate actually. And uh, what we have been after, find molecules that they are effective in inhibiting formation of hydrates. We look at the literature, we found that all the molecules work in certain range uh, of say salt concentration. We wanted the molecule that is effective on the whole range. And we are lucky again uh, uh, that we could find the molecule that's effective over the whole range of concentration. And we wanted to understand. Some of you may not be familiar with uh, hydrate. This is a picture, uh, uh, it's somehow it's in the literature and it, apparently it comes from Petrobras that they have hydrates uh, somewhere and this is the picture. So we wanted to avoid forming such a, a big uh, chunk to block flow. In hydrates, some of you are not familiar with that. If you put uh, water and uh, methane together, they form structures in the crystal structures. In the case of uh, say methane, there are something like 50 molecules of certain arrangement in case of propane, about 150 molecules of certain uh, structures. So one thing is that can we predict this from molecular stimulation, the crystalline structure. So the first thing the lab, what we did actually, we made hydrates and then we added this molecule that I'm uh, looking at. And when you add this molecule, you see that here, I form powder actually, rather than piece of hydrate, it form powders. And the other case, when there is water, I, I put basically small particles. So this is, we wanted to understand somehow the molecule is working. So the first thing is that if you can get a structure, and this work has been done by um, the group from the Professor Daniel Sloan at Colorado School of Mines. They have put water and meeting together and put it at certain conditions and for molecular simulations, they can get uh, hydrates basically. They can get hydrates. So this is distractible. The only problem is that when we started to do the work, we saw that this takes microseconds rather than what we could afford even with GPU machine. Um, and then for propane, we could not get actually hydrate. So this is something simple from thermodynamics we did. And this is what we did. In the literature, what they are doing, they are putting methane and uh, water together or dissolved you know, at equilibrium and then allow the simulation run. We use actually the concept of a stability, put maximum methane in water, which is for the conditions about 10%. Dissolution is 1%, but you can put it at the limit of say 10%. So if you put more than the limit of stability within two or three frames per second, methane pops up. If you do it below, nothing happens. Actually. And then this, we use this concept and the calculations of simulation was increased by three orders of magnitude. If you do what is in the literature, it takes a microsecond. 
but we do it actually in few nanoseconds when you use a stability concept. And I think one thing I'm seeing over and over is some of these simple thermodynamic concepts is very helpful in, uh, in, in molecular simulations. Now let's see with the molecule that we have uh, basically used <coughs> is here, we call it M1. This is C10 and this is the molecule which was in the literature, which worked in certain ranges. This is the molecule which Shell has patented. Again, this is a long time ago. Let's see what type of absorption we do get. In this case, we wanted absorption. Actually, we wanted good coverage of the hydrate uh, surface. So let's see if we put these molecules in uh, water, which has some C1 in it and so some salt in it, with or without salt, and put in contact with the hydrate surface, what we are going to see. So first of all, these molecules, if you put it in the, this is a C10, there is a structure because the water is, is, is uh, there and uh, the, there is a structure uh, around this uh, molecule like NC10, we get this type of a structure, if you put salt, some of this structure is destabilized. If this other molecule, this is the structure we do get, and this is, if you use the shell molecule, this is the structure which uh, one gets. Now let's see if we put a molecule C10 in this solution free and in contact with the surface, what is going to happen? Again, because of periodic boundary conditions, it goes the molecule in and out of the system. So we were actually pleasant surprised that in this system, in the hydrates, decaying wanted to go on the surface and it's laid down on the surface. If you do it, our molecule, This is what's going to be really like to lay down on the, on the surface. If you use shell molecule with the condition that we have used, will not want actually to go to surface and we, you can use the steered molecular dynamic simulation, which we have done, and you can see it clearly, basically. And you know, when we actually first um, found this molecule that is effective, this is the picture we had that what happens is when hydrate, small hydrate particles form, this molecule actually goes on the surface. It basically doesn't allow to grow. So that's confirmed by molecular simulations. Uh, this is the last item of my talk, which is related to a lot of material and using uh, different measurements, including the early work of uh, Professor Gobbins in get different type of measurements. Uh, so we are interested in sorption. The reason I use the term sorption is that we have uh, in what the medium, the solid medium we are looking at, we have solution, dissolution basically in the rock. We have it absorption on the pores. We have three molecules. So I'm using the for the term sorption to indicate all of them. We have flow if you are interested in flow. I'm interested in rock mechanical properties. I'm also inter interested in fluid solid surface energy in respect to fracking and why different fluids are different. And I'm actually trying to look at deformable media stability failure and and sorry this word is uh, stability means so i'm interested in a lot of different things and i look at you know books by Linda left left sheets they are looking actually more detailed than anybody else on elasticity but so far i have not seen a very systematic general derivations and clear derivations for uh, stability of deformable media and 
Oh, we almost done with uh, some studies. I'm just going to make just some points in relation to this, so not to to uh, confuse. Now, basically, when we talk about shear, is very different than other types of rock. We have a a organic part. Organic means hydrocarbons. We have inorganic part like other types of rock, carbonate rocks. So this part, which is organic, is primarily kerogen, which I'll say what this molecule is. This is this molecule, which is like asphaltine, but it's bigger, five times, six times, 10 times bigger. It's not soluble even in aromatics. So this is basically various form of uh, this kerogen molecule form this part. Uh, so what we have to do, we have to take basic kerogen molecules and then construct from molecular simulation through annealing process, uh, the porous media. So I just wanted to make a general statement that when we are working in conventional formations, hydrocarbon formations, the pores are big. We don't have to worry about basically nanoscale um, features or properties. Uh, but when you go to shell, we have very small pores. I and mean, when you have in a one or two nanometer pore, there's really no meaning even to, to scale our pressure. We are dealing with something else. So we have to do molecular simulation to interpret most of the measurements. Now here, uh, I was interested to see what is the uh, the absorption of different molecules. And there are limited experimental data. Here is the total uptake. In other words, I have kerogen. And this is only kerogen part. I put it different fluids at different pressures, and this is the uptake goes inside, which is in three configuration. My medium, solid medium here is deformable. You can think of like a polymer. But again, we have run into problems on representation of this system like with Flory Huggins type of theory. We see, we, we see some issues, but molecular simulations uh, will, will help us there. Uh, there is no swelling measurements. These rocks like polymers, when you bring in contact with some material, they swell. We did not find any literature in, in this area uh, that they, someone has measured swelling. So, we had to do molecular simulations and the molecular simulation tells us CO2 has the highest swelling compared to as the size of a molecule increases, the swelling uh, decreases. Uh, so the consequence here is that if we have swelling, you, when you remove it, you get shrinkage. And shrinkage may, need, may mean subsidence, basically, movement, movement of the solid body. So that's important to know. Now, in terms of flow, there's all kinds of things that one can do. Basically flow in uh, nanopores and even carbon nanotubes. And this is a work with the first time was done. Two papers around 2006, 2007. One of them published in Nature. Actually, I was talking to some colleagues. They told me the paper which was submitted to Nature. The whole paper was rejected because they were claiming that flow in nanopores slit nanopores, carbon nanotubes are very high. And this is basically from that paper, you see that if you use crudson diffusion, and that's the assumption we make in some small pores, underestimates the flow compared to measurement by an order of magnitude and in terms of uh, for liquids and for high pressure, even the order is different if you go by, by uh, macroscopic uh, calculations. So we basically were interested to see why there is such a large enhancement. And we found out that here, I will go very quickly, that what we do get, we had the adsorb phase, but the adsorb phase also moves very fast. Adsorb phase has much higher density than the non adsorb phase. If as velocity comparable, we do get very high uh, flow rate. Uh, and so th this is a paper we published about two years ago. 
Now, let's go now to something else. And that's what actually I'm working on now on uh, getting uh, mechanical properties of uh, rocks, uh, which there has been a lot of work, but in the area of uh, shale and kerogen, basically there is, I would say none. So what you do, you basically stretch a rock. And if you stretch it too much, it's going to be failure. So this relates to stability. And also you can get mechanical properties like uh, basically young modulus or change in dimension. We call it Poisson ratio. But then you stretch a rock basically. Either you stretch it or compress it. And uh, we wanted to simulate it. Again, with respect to kerogen. There are two or three papers related areas. All of them are recent. So this is what you do basically. You have the system in the middle and then you can extend it or you can compress it. And you can have different boundaries basically. On the side, you can keep as constant is pressure constant or you can get the strain constant, you can fix it. And then we'll let's see what uh, we do get. So in molecular simulation, what we do basically, we move molecules, atoms, molecules in a very, very um, a small displacement to get quasi steady, quasi state. So we move, move it from 0.2 to 0.5 of each of these atoms basically in the simulations. And we repeat it. And if we do it, this part of work has been done in the literature. So we are doing it for verification. So on the right has been done in the literature. So if you stretch it, basically you see that you increase basically the bond length and after a while it breaks. Now there's a difference between elite, which is rock, and the other one, which is in the molecule that I mentioned. And then you know, if you plot the stress versus the strain, you get uh, what's there. Uh, sorry, I have to turn down the radio. It's classical music, but I have to turn it down. <laughs> Sorry for interruption. <laughs> no problem. So That's here so basically good. we have a sorry. Yeah, but good music too loud. So this is what we do basically to get uh, mechanical properties, failure, and uh, uh, you know, molecular simulation is great. Uh, so basically, if we do it on the compression and on the tension. We go different directions, and uh, uh, we, we can change the have the pressure outside different. Basically, uh, changing the stresses. All of them we can do molecular simulation and understand it basically. And now, if you just plot on one, we see that there are two regions. This is in the elastic region. Basically, doesn't you see? We get the same young modulus in in expression in this extension and compression. This is the plastic region. Then it's, it's different. In the elastic region, we have reversibility. In the plastic region, we don't. And this is basically what I was saying. See, in the, in the elastic region, you, go, you can go back and forth. But in the plastic region, this is what you get. Both in, uh, you know, in, uh, in, in the, in, in the uh, two compression and extension processes and different cycles. Uh, so this is going to get me to the last slide. I could have, have many slides here, but you know, one thing I have become a little bit surprised lately is that when we are working with solids, uh, there are a lot of papers in the literature, they treat solids as uh, fluids. And I was mentioning to one of the colleagues that there is a book on thermodynamics of solids. There is no stress in the book. Everything is really coming from a fluid side. But if you go to the work expression in dynamics, basically there is one term which is related to the work you do from uh, stress and strain. So this is the two, and this is double summation here. This is the notation I've ad adopted. So we have this extra term basically. So if you wanted to get the surface energy here, 
basically, if it, in the case of fluids, and we can do it and try to get the surface tension, uh, this is uh, what we do. But if we go to the solid, actually, this is going to a different process. So we have to be careful and then, you know, do it. But I don't see that. Uh, I think there is more the need for basically paying more attention when you are looking, even on the case of uh, contact angle that we do. If we put the solid part, we have to be careful, basically. And uh, so, and the reason I'm interested in the process because for this is the type of formulation that I'm going to use to do molecular simulations of the of the process. So I think I'm running out of my time. Uh, so all I want to say that maybe if there is uh, room for me next year, I can come back and give a talk only on uh, this topic and uh, that I mentioned uh, briefly. Uh, so this is basically my general remarks. Uh, what I see that actually, in, at least uh, from a lot of people, I observe do molecular simulations. And since I'm new into the field, I see that a lot of time, the classical thermodynamic concepts are not fully used. But if you do both of them together, it seems that it's going to be more effective. And the other thing that at least in the areas in related to petroleum, what I see molecular engineering and molecular si simulations are going to be extremely helpful because we have to go for new material. The material, the type of work we have been doing basically, we have not looked at some aspects. So that's extremely helpful to move in that direction. And I've also one suggestion you know, my experience with the college from Brazil has been excellent. I've had uh, two PhD students from Brazil at uh, Yale and a number of other uh, colleagues. Uh, and the same thing is the experience uh, from my colleagues at Rice. So I wanted to use this opportunity to suggest that we love to get more Brazilian students at Rice. And so I'm giving this message on my behalf and the message of my colleagues. So that's the suggestion. And at the end, basically, these are the sponsors I have had over the years. And a lot of them, maybe some of them are gone. But the uh, relationship with Petrobras, and especially here uh, for, you know, Dr. Rodrigo Esposito is there, has been very um, helpful with others. You know, I've had also a number of others, including visitors uh, from, uh, from Brazil. I have learned a lot. Uh, from them, uh, so I will thank uh, Petrobras and they are supporting now my, my work. Also, Federal University of Rio de Janeiro was involved, helping us in research and interaction. So the experience with Brazil has been super, uh, but the most important part has been working with the very uh, top people and uh, pleasant people too. So that's uh, what I wanted to share with this uh, knowledgeable group and uh, uh, I wanted, rather than taking one topic, I, 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 I tried to give a general overview on some, some ideas. So I look forward to the comments and suggestions and thoughts. Thank you, Professor Perezabaj, for your marvelous presentation. Between here and our YouTube channel, you got almost uh, 70 simultaneous views. And you are now open for questions. If you want to ask one, please enable your microphone or write down in the chat and you read it. Our YouTube videos can write down also, of course. So anyone want to make a first question? Can I? Sure. Yes, Professor. <laughs> Thanks, Abbas, for the nice presentation, nice pictures, and, and for the music, it's good. <laughs> uh, uh, well, I, I do like the, the DPD uh, approach because uh, some, some problems we need a very long time simulation uh, and use uh, molecular dynamics, we cannot reach this time. Uh, one of those is kind of rheology. Uh, if you are 
uh, look at the rheology, uh, you need some uh, uh, longer simulations. Uh, bigger, but, bigger simulations. Yeah, uh, but, uh, but I wonder is, is uh, kind of uh, how we parameterize uh, the, the model because uh, I don't see uh, in literature a uh, 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 way, a general way to uh, to define the parameters from these uh, cost grain models. Can you you comment on this? Well, basically, you know, your basically your experience is the experience we have had is that first of all, from the material in the literature, it's hard to see basically how to get the parameter. You you know something. Uh, in, in terms of, you know, chi parameter, how translated into the parameter. But these are actually is not the, uh, these are not issue with the model. The issue with the way things are, are, are described. I think the parameters, you need some of them to get, say, for interfacial tension in, in some way. So these parameters are available and it's not, to me, I, what we did actually, the first thing we did, we compared the results from MD simulations and DPD simulations. That's the very first thing we did. And I was surprised that you get very similar results. But there is the important step of getting the parameters of the DPD model and understanding. And that part, I would say that there is a deficient. Actually, I have a new postdoc with trying to uh, set up a code, a new code uh, for uh, viscosity calculations. And even what I see that even that we have two papers on the subject, we are running into problem basically from time to time, how this was done. But once we go through detail, we see it's there. So I think the, I don't worry about the parameters basically. There is link uh, to some established theories. And again, you know, what we did in our case, we did two things. One, we compared the result from DPD with the uh, MD simulations. MD simulation took a very long, and molecular structure basically. MD uh, took a long, long time. And again, we have GPU machines even, but it still takes a very long time. And then we also use DPD, very similar results, and this is, in one of the two papers that I have cited. So I don't see that. So far, our experience has been good. And what we do get also the interfacial tension for these polymers that we have worked uh, was available. So that we try to predict it, to see, verify it basically. So these are the steps we have done. And then you do, you know, you use pure CO2 because in pure CO2, you put two or three molecules together and then you, you can look at density. There is verification in step, but I don't see a problem there. And I, not, I did not have this opinion at the very beginning. Thanks. Okay, uh, Esa Haydarian has a question, so you can go and then Professor Bruno Orta can ask you. Sure. As a, open your mic microphone and also your camera if you can. Please. Yeah, it's already turned on. Okay, I, I can see this on. Oh, nice. How's it going? Very good, nice seeing you. Uh, thank you very much. Professor Pirzodi, would you please bring the uh, presentation, the, the slide number 38? Okay. It may take me a while because I'm going one by one, but I will be quick. What relates to, is it this? No, no, uh, yes. And the, that one before this, uh, this, uh, this slide, that one that you uh, provided a snapshot of your calculation to the end, uh, your simulation. Yeah, this one, exactly here, yeah, this one. It's a very interesting work. You know, uh, uh, Hopefully, we will find uh, more details regarding your simulation in a future literature. Because of you. But uh, this my main question here is that uh, this is a this is an aqueous solution, and you injected the CO two in the water, as well as added amount of a chemical. There is no water here. Basically, there is CO two, mm -hmm. CO two, and then. Uh, 
fluorinated mud. There is no water here. Mm -hmm. But really as, CO2. as a matter of fact, how we can neglect the CO2 in a, such a uh, situation? Sorry, this is basically the um, molecule that we have here is uh, mostly CO2. And there is two weight per uh, this uh, polymer. So only CO2 uh -huh. and polymer. It is showing that uh -huh. the molecules, some of them aggregate through pi pi uh -huh. bonding, intra pi pi bonding, inter, inter pi pi bonding. So that's really all it's showing. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice work. Uh, nice work. But it, it would be very interesting if uh, you can put a amount of water in it and. Just close well, I think we have done it. Actually, what we have done, we have put because water dissolved in CO2, say 0.5%, 1%, depending on the condition. Mm -hmm. This all and affect the process. So mm -hmm. here, basically, we have also a steady effect of water. The effect of water is not pronounced here. The only case the effect of water is pronounced is here. Mm -hmm. Small amount of water. Point weight, and you see that if you compare okay, with this, there is more aggregation, basically. Mm -hmm. So, but the uh, amount of water. Okay, okay. So, uh, the, the question regarding the CO two and the water: uh, Do you have CO two in uh, such case also, or it is just a pure water and the polymer? Basically, these systems are. Majority is CO2. Mm -hmm. A small part, either we have water or we don't have, but the water solubility is uh, low. So we put 0.34% water. And then here in this case is 1.5% of the polymer. So this is the system basically. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the question the can rise here is that. The dissociation of the CO2 in water, which is turning the CO2 into the ions, and how the ions are interacting with this polymer. No, I think again, what we have done here and this system, I'm not sure, you know, uh, for this case, if we have some ions, there is some effect uh, from the from the change maybe in, in charge, but we are we are assuming that CO2 basically has uh, uh, a uh, point charge. Mm -hmm. it's not, it's, it is not dissociating. It is just it remains solid. Yes. Okay. So uh, just another quick question: uh, Did you use the coarse grain uh, the theory for those simulations and, uh, for your force field, or it is just the pure yeah. uh, data from the tables? But you know, basically, I think if you go details of uh, DPD simulation the force field is very different than the concept we have from MDC. This is what Fred was referring to, that how these parameters, that's a very different concept and I have decided not to get into it. So that's not anything close to or similar to uh, MDC. It's very different actually. The way of looking at the force field is divided in different parts. So it's a different, very different way of looking at the force field. That's nice. Thank you very much. Thank Have a nice day. Hello, Professor Firozabaji. Thank you for your talk. Uh, I have a question. Maybe I, I didn't get at the, I didn't pay enough attention when you were explaining the diff, when you use, uh, you, you said a thermodynamic concept in order to uh, equilibrate faster the, the system with the hydrate. Uh -huh. So you, you kind of manage it to get the crystallization much quicker than uh -huh. the usual protocol. Could you elaborate a little more on, on, on what you mean with this thermodynamic concept in practice? What, what did you do in practice? Let me go to you. Okay, yeah. This concept, I have used it in other, other areas. Okay, here. Suppose you put methane and water together at a certain condition and temperature. 
solubility of methane in water is going to be given by the equality of the chemical potentials and is 1%. Now suppose you take water and suppose disperse methane to it uh, 10%. Now, water may take methane for a long time or may not take it at all. If you are above the limit of stability, for this case, say 10%. If you are above the limit of stability in simulation within one or two femtoseconds or time steps, methane will, if, it, if I go above 10%, which is the limit of stability I have uh, calculated. If you put 11% or 10.5%, methane will come out right away. If I put it below 10%, 9.5, methane, water will keep, keep methane for some time. Let me give you another example. Suppose you take water and heat it up water very fast. When you heat it up very fast, it will not boil. Water is supposed to boil at 100 degrees. But if you heat it up very fast, it will boil at, say, you know, if you do experiment, maybe it will boil 120, 130 degrees. There is a limit of a stability for water for boiling, which is actually 270 degrees centigrade. If you go above 270, if you heat up water above 270, it will vaporize right away. But if you are below that limit, is for some time, it will not, it will hold it. So here I'm using <coughs> the concept of thermodynamic stability in order to put maximum CH4 in water. So already I have it when I start it. So it goes basically, I don't have it to bring it by diffusion basically. So this is really the concept. I have, you know, I have it in detail expressed in chapter four of my book. There are many books in some language and actually I'm to apply the same concept. If I stretch it, it will break. What is the limit? And then use a unified theory for fluid and solid in a simple way. But this is the concept of stability and that helped us to carry the calculation. Actually, not only is faster, if you look at here, if I don't use that concept, the people have used it, they have to do the calculation below 250 degrees Kelvin, which is very off. In my calculation, what I do, I, because if I, here I do it at 260, I will not get actually nucleation, uh, crystallization. In my kind of approach, I get 285, which is very close to what the experiments are. So not only it's faster, it actually helps to be in more realistic condition. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so it's clear. Also, sure. because uh, th there is another effect that maybe plays a role in the in the sense that to explain why the left approach could be even slower is also because they they have a, a very high subcooling degree, which means that the kinetic energy and the diffusion of the particles are also slower than in your but case. But they have to have it in order actually to get the material to it. In other words, if you do it, if you do it, the approach on the left, which is actually, this paper was published in Science. I don't have all of them. And I think this was done the first time. We should give them credit, basically. But apparently in the title, even as I recall, there is the title of microsecond calculation, which means very long. And we can do exactly the same calculation in 1,000 times less. And besides that, I have another paper with propane, which is more complicated. I can get the structure if I use what, what I have it on the right. If I do on the left, I cannot do it. So once we did this, then we look at the propane also hydrates, and we can get it. So because I could put much more now than before. So all I do, I calculate the stability limit for the concentration, which is basically d mu one by dx one. You know, mu is the chemical position by x at the limit of a stability zero. And then I can get the concentration so I can keep it. And I was surprised in molecular simulation that within one or two times, if you go a little bit above it, 
methane will pop up basically. If I'm below it, it is the other surprise actually. So this means extremely uh, powerful concept, very simple, which uh, can be used. Thank you for the detailed explanation. Thank you sure. for your talk. Okay, so do we have any more questions? Yeah, I think there's some questions, uh, some references. I will catch a lot of things. Send me an email, I will uh, reply promptly. Uh, well, Master, excuse me, this is a serious positive. Uh, uh, yes, I think I will, I will send some questions for you by email, no, not to waste your time here, okay? Very nice presentation. Thank you so much. It's good to see you. Right. you know, we have had, uh, enjoyed interaction with Roger for a long time. Thanks, Roger. Okay. Uh, he, should, he should have a question, I think. Sure. Okay. What is the question? English. Uh, Professor Richard, Chief Richard, are you here? I think he not. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so let's wrap up. Thank you again, Professor Abashir. Um, uh, excuse me, uh, this is uh, Charlie from U of A. So yes. hi, Abbas. Okay. Hope you and uh, your wife, Kashan, is uh, doing well in, I don't know, I think you're in Palo Alto, right? Yes, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. So nice to meet you on the in virtual way. Uh, I had just uh, one quick question, actually. Uh, you just quickly uh, work through the talking about the wettability of the substrates and you talk about the calcite. And the reason we are trying to follow up one of your uh, Langmuir paper published in 2019 that is using the pantanol to change the wettabilities. And we noticed that you, based on your test, your, the, the zeta potential calcite in your work is negative value. But we, all do, we do also see some other literatures are talking about calcite is generally positively charged. So could you comment on the rock property of the calcite because that is really important in terms right. of when we select the surfactants. Yeah, by the way, you know, those of you who don't know, uh, Charlie, mm -hmm. uh, the professor at the University of Alberta, he did a lot of work basically on uh, Marika. So he did contribute a lot and his work is actually uh, being very well cited. Now, the, what we are doing actually, we are focusing a lot on the solid surfaces, and solid surfaces basically have different type, different charges, and some of them depending on what has been the exposure before, the charge is different. For example, give you a different example. If we take quartz, that's different example I'm giving. In other words, you could have different charges and different style, it is, if it's hydroxylated, you get completely different thing. So there are different varieties de depending on the exposure. So it's not only one type, I mean, very, very nut, nutshell, basically. And, uh, but uh, I think calcite may be even simpler, the surface that you talked about, than even uh, some other surface like uh, quartz. It may be much simpler, but it's true that it's not only one type and there are variations too. Okay, thank you, thank you. Thanks, Charles. Nice to see you. Nice to see you too, Frederico. Thank you all for the question and thank you again, Professor Teresa Baji for joining us for this amazing presentation. We are really glad to have you here. Thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation. It is always uh, fun to share thoughts with uh, colleagues in uh, Brazil. <laughs> okay, okay, thank you.